Thank you all for joining me and being Hi, here for all this. I'm Hannah, I'm going to be moderating our chat about disability and sex and dating and relationships. And we've got Nima, Charlie, Jessica and Emily. Um, and first of all, I thought we could go around and just say what our disability condition is. Nima. Okay. Um, so I had cancer in my spine when I was three months old, um, which left me with a weakness of, it crushed all the nerves basically um, in my lower spine. So I've got weakness of the legs and the condition's called paraparesis. So it just means that the muscles are weak um, and that like the upper body is okay, but it's just partial paralysis of the legs. Mm -hmm. I've got um, cerebral palsy, uh, spastic diplegia edition. Um, <laughs> 2.0. <laughs> I love that. It sounds like you could collect them all as well. <laughs> were, you think, were you thinking of that for like 20 minutes before we started? <laughs> no, I, I've, I've used it before. I've, I've said it before. Very they could trade disability cards. <laughs> yes. It just worry. means that my um, legs are much more affected than my upper body. And yeah, so the spasticity is much more caused in my legs. And that means that... I have issues with walking and standing for long periods of time. That leads me to not say very much because I've also got cerebral palsy of the same edition. Should <laughs> <laughs> you get points for that or something? I mean, so, I should do, should oh, I really? Should, yeah. <laughs> oh. Um, okay, well, I have a thing. I have a hereditary disability called hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsies with mixed connective tissue disorder, which also leads to postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Totally going to remember this. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. No one needs to remember what the hell that is. Um, but basically, it has a range of symptoms, so it affects my nerves, muscles, organs, uh, my hearing. I'm deaf. This is my sign interpreter, Ruthann. <laughs> She's going to be here telling me what the hell you guys are saying. And also, chronic pain, chronic fatigue, all that good stuff that comes with it. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Probably and chronically beautiful, so you're all right. Oh. Yeah, oh. very true, very true. <laughs> Flat. <laughs> um, and I have a chronic illness, um, ulcerative colitis, and in January I had surgery to remove my colon, and I now have a stoma bag. Um, so, let's get into this. First of all, I want to know what your guys' sex education was like growing up, whether that was like in school or from parents family, the internet, um, and did it meet your needs? I've got quite a good story about this. Oh, do tell. So my sex education at school was pretty horrendous, as I, I can almost guarantee most of ours might have yeah. been. Um, before I lost my virginity, um, obviously the sex education that I'd had, none of the bodies in any of the videos had related to, to what my body looks like and can and can't do. Um, I remember the, the banana... The, the condom on the banana. We put it on a test tube, which is just so not accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and a bit too delicate as well. Like, what if, you, what if you're heavy handed and you bring the test yeah. tube? <laughs> so I, I remember that, but that is pretty much all I remember, aside from looking at these bodies and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be able to do that. So before I lost my virginity, I remember saying to my, uh, my auntie and my twin sister, oh my goodness, I'm really nervous about this. I've no idea what my body's going to be able to do, what positions yeah. it, it is going to be able to get in um is it going to be really painful so they said right okay let's solve this problem before you use, lose your virginity and they took me up into the back bedroom of my auntie's house and we practiced positions on each other nice. oh so my god that is my sex education everybody what an amazing that's family <laughs> that is love right there isn't it weirdly that is awesome i guess mine's kind of the same um my parents are quakers and they have a policy that children Children are on an equal level with adults and any question a child asks should be answered with the full and completely honest <laughs> truth. I love where I this is going. I knew way too much, way too young. So when I was four, I, came up to, I, um, I walked up to my mother and I was like, Mummy, so I know that men can love men. She's like, yes, darling, yes. So I was like, but then what? And boy, was that an experience. <laughs> it was like two hours sex education on man-on-man -on -man sex. <laughs> I was like, 
<laughs> wow, <Well>, okay. <laughs> I know everything now. Fully enlightened four-year-old. Oh, yeah. I think probably by the time I had started primary school, I, I knew mostly everything there was to know. How did that affect you and your, like, when other people were learning about stuff, other kids and your friends? Oh, so they would come to me and ask me questions to go and ask my mum and then come back the next day. Love so that. I was like the little education train. So they'd come up and be like, what happens when... Dot, 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 and I'm like... Mm, good question. Mummy, <laughs> what happens when? And she's like, I love well. This. And thorough answers, thorough. Can well, I, can I ask your mum a few questions, please? <laughs> I think I sure, if you'd, like, if you'd like her number, yes, please. she's <laughs> always available. I Loves seem a good to, text. I seem to remember my sister asking, we were on a, a drive somewhere, and my sister asked my mum what a blowjob was, and I think we were about nine, and my mum literally <laughs> nearly crashed the car. Like She was like, don't ever ask me a question like that ever again. So I think I needed your mum a little bit yeah, as well. Yeah, like, complete opposite of my parents. Any question that I asked always got the answer, even if it was, like, taxes. What are taxes, parents? <laughs> They'd be like... Let's sit. And then you wish you'd never <laughs> asked. Why did I ask this? <laughs> no. So I used to try and sometimes look stuff up before I asked my parents, just to check if I wanted to know the answer. Yeah, Google. Google is your friend. The internet. I'm not that young. <laughs> oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm now just remembering we didn't have the internet. No, when we, we didn't. Were... So sad. Google, Google wasn't actually around when I was four. <laughs> no, no. Not for me either. I'm just remembering <laughs> this What do we do? <laughs> Dial up. Um, oh, yeah. I wanted to also ask, like, if your formal sex education in school or from parents maybe wasn't as I'd love your thorough. story. Yeah, or wasn't as practical. thorough as that. <laughs> we didn't talk about it in my family. Yeah, where did you get that information from then? We didn't talk about it. So we, just, so we don't talk about sex in my family just because we're a traditional like Indian household in that you don't really talk about that kind of stuff. And it's not that it's taboo or that my parents don't want me having sex. We just They just think we don't need to talk about it. Mm. So, I mean, it's pretty... It's a traditional point of view. But at my school, it was... I went to a mainstream school with a unit attached um, where, you know, the if you had a, an impairment, you would go and get your treatment, your physio, you know, there was someone to talk to, you had your PAs that helped in lessons. Um, and the majority of the kids, when we were going through sex education, were removed from the sessions. Oh. And, yeah, oh, wow. yeah. So, and I was just like, no, I want to stay because I feel like I... I, I felt like I couldn't necessarily relate to the images that I saw, but I related to the fact that I did want a relationship and I did want to have sex at some point and I wanted to have those experiences mm. in life. Mm. But I think they just assumed that the other guys didn't. Wow. It's mm. so important to know things, though. Knowledge is power. And if Even you don't if, feel like you're going to grow up to be loved and have affection and, you know, intimacy, you, you, you know, you're in a lonely place. It's not very nice. That's so yeah. interesting that it was just like by default, just assumed. It was like, a little bit backwards. Like this yeah. isn't relevant to you. Despite so. having the unit, which you know was supposed to be empowering and mm. enabling us to study mm. alongside able-bodied students, it was really strange. It was odd. Yeah. Wow. Well, so where did you end up learning about all this stuff, and then like specifically for your my needs? friends? Yeah. Yeah, my able-bodied friends. Yeah. Mm. Like Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica's mum. <laughs> <laughs> we would have been there for Jessica's you. Jessica's mum on speed dial. She could have wrote, written you a little book. I think, for me, I looked up a lot of questions online and I was, like, sites... I remember one called Ask Alice that used to be around a little while ago and that was based in the, in the US because I was literally kind of asking questions around the kind of am I normal kind mm. of stuff largely because yes my body wasn't necessarily represented in the in the sex ed that we were having but also because the sex ed just didn't go far enough in regards to how I was feeling in relation to my body and and things like that and it also didn't it didn't really explore anything to do with um sexuality and I knew that I wasn't I knew that I wasn't straight probably when I was about 14 or 15. And so I was on like various different forums and just kind of asking questions and trying to find a peer network through that. But then again, not a lot of people there were disabled. And so it's this kind of crossover between LGBT identity and disability where that kind of community doesn't necessarily exist as strongly as it may do for a disability community or an LGBT community. Totally. Just a lot of lack of information on both yeah, sides exactly. and then added together, 
Yeah. Exactly. Fun fact, one third of LGBTQ plus people have a disability or mental health condition. And that's, that's so only many. the people who are willing to disclose. Wow. Yeah, it's so a, it's there's actually enough. a really high crossover between those two groups of people. Yeah. yeah. And it always surprises me that there isn't enough education about disability and sex as well, because even like, say, if you're looking at your class that you've got to teach, be like, oh, but none of my students are disabled, but they might end up in a relationship mm -hmm. with somebody who is. Um, or they might have a hidden impairment. You might yeah, not be able to Or they may acquire the disability yeah. and things like that. Yeah. But then, of course, that leads on to the discussion of like with like, of how they think that a disabled person's only going to end yes. up with a disabled person. Yeah. Yes, we were talking about this oh, earlier, goodness. weren't we? Have you experienced any of that firsthand of people expecting you to date yeah. other disabled people? When I, when I talk about my boyfriend, one of the first questions is, oh, is he in a wheelchair too? Like, the ones get quite excited about, does does that jigsaw <laughs> puzzle fit? <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I say no, and, it, and it's almost like, oh, wow, OK, so so how, how did you meet each other? And they're really surprised at, right, OK, so a non-disabled and a disabled person have, have got together, and how possibly can this mysterious thing have happened? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you were saying as well, weren't you, about the, the saint, the yeah. angel yeah. situation? Yes, yeah. because I am married... To my wonderful wife, Claudia. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, we make videos together on YouTube. And one of the most common things underneath is just like, Claudia is such an angel. She's such a saint. She's such a wonderful person. And like, she is really grumpy in the mornings before her tea, okay? <laughs> She's not a saint. Um, but just the very idea that someone who is able-bodied would deign to date someone with a disability. Mm. They must be such a good person to go through that. Yeah. And you're like, Christ, hey, <laughs> yeah. I am lovely, okay? <laughs> she gets a lot from this relationship. And I guess it like puts them as like above human. Yeah. And then yeah. the person saying that is placing themselves as human, like, well, as a human, I wouldn't date a disabled person. Yeah. I'm not I'm not angelic enough to like put up with that. Because yeah. that yeah. sees disability as something negative or something yeah. bad. Undesirable. Yeah. I had a I had a previous partner actually that said to me, wouldn't you be happier in a relationship with another disabled person? Wow. I've had that said to me as well. Why? And it's just... What's the logic there? I have no idea. <laughs> I think they it's... think they're being helpful and yeah. that they're being nice and that they're trying to give us positive advice. Like, and like your life would be easier. Yes, and, you know, you'd have somebody that understands you. Yeah. Well, not necessarily because we're both, you know, we've both been down different paths in life. Mm -hmm. Also... Yeah. Being disabled is not, we're not a monolithic force. <laughs> we don't all have exactly the same experience of exactly the same type of disability that has affected our life in exactly the same way. Even if you're thinking about like, oh, if you are disabled and you date someone who's also disabled, you won't face so much ableism in your relationship. You're like, disabled people can be ableist mm. in yes. different yeah. ways. <clears throat> Very true. Like, Very true. And it's also how kind of that, interaction so say if i you know all of my partners have not been dis uh, have been non-disabled um and they've often been asked questions of why are you with this person why do you want to be with this person and those kind of things and how you know how does it make you feel if you have to carry their pint all the time or or whatever it is and like it's such a chore <laughs> and obviously that <laughs> That question then comes back to me because that person is feeling kind of as if they needed an answer or if they needed to say something. And then often that can lead to some kind of step on the way towards a relationship breakdown mm. because then you realise that that person does feel as if some of these things are a chore because they didn't or weren't able to actively challenge it. Mm. Yeah, I was actually going to ask something like that. Have your partners ever experienced like weird or nasty comments because they're dating a disabled person? Mm, not that I know of necessarily. I know that um, my ex-boyfriend got quite a few questions at work around like, OK, so, so, so how do things work then? Mm. But in all honesty, I think sometimes as long as... As long as those questions are meant with good intention and they're reasonably sensible, in a way, I don't see the problem with that because I think you might as well be asking somebody that knows the answer yeah. rather than just assuming, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I in a way, it can dispel around. some more myths uh, if it's asked and answered in the right way. Um, I did once go through a really, a really big 
kind of tough time with an ex-boyfriend and I, I hate remember, this story I re- oh, I'm not going to tell the story I'm not telling the story <laughs> I want to know now <laughs> and uh, somebody that I know said um, just think about it before you finish things with him because you might not have another able-bodied boyfriend again I've had some I've had similar things Ouch. just think about it just stay in the relationship and be really unhappy because you might not have a, dis- uh, a non-disabled partner ever again I've, yeah, I've had similar things, but it was said to me by the person that I was in a relationship with. Like, as in what? trying to persuade that, you to stay in that drink. relationship? Yeah. So... Um, they said you should stay with me because you're basically not going to do any better. That's Not the, yeah, quite that, those words, but yeah, pretty the much. The sentiment. I, yeah, Ew! I had a... Did you break up with them straight away? I, I wish I had the strength to, but I didn't. I know how that feels. Oh, I think this is. I think I'm going to find this quite hard to go through. Ten minutes in. <laughs> no, but guys, this is a really big problem. Like I spent so my right. whole life feeling a little bit substandard, and when I'm like looking to date a guy, if he is able-bodied, I've spoken to like therapists about this. Where I just think, oh, if if you've got a shelf of toys and one's broken and one's fixed and shiny and new, why would you go for the broken one? And that's how I felt up until like <laughs> seriously. I wasn't trying to laugh. Sex toys. Uh, no, I no, <laughs> no, I wasn't trying to laugh. It, it's because it's it it just got me right like it. You do empathise. I, I can totally empathise, which is for some reason this time it came out with a laugh. But I was just trying to. <laughs> I was. No, and yeah. I hold hands across the table. No, guys, honestly, like, it like plagues me. I'm with you. <laughs> Holding you hands is like a really good idea. No, we're just doing it, it on so, our own. So <laughs> it is painful, and I've started to try and. Like, I, I'm better now. I don't think mm-hmm. about myself in that way because at the end of the day, you know, you've got to back yourself, and we're, we, should, we should be our own biggest fan. Yes, girl. But it's hard. It's yeah. really hard. Yeah. I'm not giving up, but it's just, it's hard. Yeah. Like, I, I can imagine, like, to an extent, because a lot of the weird internal thought process that I've been having because I've acquired like I've had the uh, chronic illness since I was seven but it's not really affected me until like this year with the surgery and everything and I'm in a relationship and I keep on having this thought process and I'm like no 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 like that's it's like really ableist thoughts which is like oh I'm so glad I'm in a relationship I've no idea how I would cope if I was having to like be dating but I think that's a natural yeah. thought I, th- I actually think all yeah. the thoughts that we have are actually perfectly yeah. normal and why you know if you yeah. of course you're going to feel like that from time to time mm. we've just got to not let it plague us yeah like when you are dating how do you deal with disclosing your disability like when and how you feel like you've got a story. <laughs> You're like, ooh. No, I just used to not say anything. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And then just turn up. And then like. the big, no, or, or just do kind of, just eke it into the conversation towards the end when it's when it's time for us to meet. Yes. And then it would be met with an instant ghosting. It didn't get me anywhere. Wow. So, so this is when you're online dating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, had, I had a policy of I'm not wasting my time. I'm not going to kind of go, oh, yeah, I'm deaf, which people, by the way, seem really weirdly okay with. Like, when I was dating, people were like, yeah, sure, we can go on a first date. Because I put on my profile, I'm deaf. But why, why, why? So they were like, yeah, okay. And then I'd turn up and I'd be like, right, now I'm going to tell you about my entire condition. <laughs> because I am not going to, you know, force out all of my energy for five dates with you, get emotionally invested, yeah. then tell you oh what's God. up. And you suddenly go, oh, no. I, I don't have that much time. So how did we you are going to discuss me? right now. Huh? How, how did you and Claudia meet? Uh, we met online. Ah. as most couples do nowadays <laughs> and actually on our first date she wanted to meet in a pub and because I don't drink I don't really go to pubs mm. that much so I had to ask my flatmate what a good pub was <laughs> to go to Love that. so we went and uh, I ordered a virgin cocktail so mm. like I was drinking a regular cocktail mm. and she came in and she thought that I was wearing a bluetooth headset because my hearing aids amazing yeah and then she, she didn't even question it because she's that type of person so you hadn't disclosed I guess I hadn't. Yeah. I think. Mm. I know. I guess not. I think I was on a variety of different dating websites, <laughs> and I think that one didn't have. I didn't. I hadn't said anything. Not on purpose. It, I just hadn't. Yeah. So she thought it was a Bluetooth headset, like for about two hours into the date, and then I was like, "No, I'm, I'm deaf." And she's like, oh! Like, she just thought I was incredibly rude before that point. <laughs> I'm just going to keep my head set in, don't mind me. Because I'm having another conversation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You conference talking. call, conference call. <laughs> I'm so busy all the time. Yeah. But no, otherwise, I was very much like, first date, I think I did it with Claude as well. First date, I was like, right, 
we're going to discuss my condition. This is what it is. This is what it means day to day. It means that I, I can't do these things. I'm never going to go on a hike with you. But I am great at baking. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really warm. I really love people and friends. And blah, 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 blah. We like national trust houses, so we can go to those together. All that kind of stuff. Because... You know, I'm not going to waste my time. Mm. People yeah. need to know. There are a lot of people who don't like hiking as well. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Jessica, you told me that you've been on 70 first yeah. dates. Yeah. Was. Wow. I've been on, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on 70 first dates and I've only been on three second dates in my life and I'm married to one of them. So... That's insane. And exhausting. And we only got married when I was 26, so... Yeah, how did you fit in all those dates? That's a lot of dating. I was busy. I was really busy. <laughs> I, I did, because my energy isn't huge, I'd try and schedule them in one after another. So I did, like, i go up to London and have three dates in a row That's in one like day. <laughs> you minx. I like that. <laughs> I was like, I am determined to find my perfect lady. <laughs> and, um, and my mother was like, good luck with that. Have but fun. you did. But I did, did. exactly. See, it no one thought Amazing. I would find anyone. And then anyone, if one worked, you could just cancel the next <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Did you have two dates much. lined up after Claudia and you were like, cancel them quick? You know, I don't remember, but I probably did. <laughs> or, like the weekend after and then I met her and was like, this is true love, <laughs> go away. <laughs> the rest of you can leave. <laughs> yeah, it was quite like that, love at first sight. Amazing. What I find really odd when you're often dating is... So for some of the um, guys that I've uh, like went on first dates with through Grinder or whatever, often they would use the opportunity to then talk about their own relationship to disability that was often wasn't theirs, okay. but it was like someone in their family, and so, and this would always make me feel extremely awkward because I wouldn't want to be making it about my disability, and often on the way to the date is when I would disclose and say, by the way, I walk with a stick, because I would then assume that, kind of, as I've kind of explored this uh, getting older, I kind of realised that if I put myself first and I put what kind of the big thing that I think it is out first, then if people aren't going to be interested in that, then they're not going to turn up and they're not going to be uh, there, so I won't. I won't feel hurt by that as a as a result. Self protecting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Self protecting. Be less hurt by them not turning up than by if they did turn up, but then weren't interested. It's more kind Saves of. Saves yourself, doesn't it? Yeah, it's more kind of saving myself because if uh, if they had turned up and then made it more about my disability than I felt comfortable with, then I could remove myself. Whereas if I didn't say it, there would be all of the awkward questions that were related to the disability, the way I walked, why I needed them to carry my drink, whatever it might have been. And I would much rather have put all of that first mm. to say, effectively, here's what you're getting involved right, with. This is the package. This is yeah. the, yeah, this is me. And then if, if they then walked away at that point, I wasn't as hurt as if, you know. Yeah, totally. No, yeah. I I am very forward with it, very straightforward. Because I think in a way, Nima, you might agree with me on this, I don't know. I think in a way we're quite fortunate in the sense that our impairments are so, so visible yeah. mm -hmm. that almost I can't go on a first date without saying anything because exactly. if there's a restaurant with five steps up to it that the guy's taking me to, well, first date's over before it's even started. You know what I mean? So yeah. I almost it's almost the only polite thing to do because it, that's on me. That's my responsibility to let that person know that I need access. Mm -hmm. It's not their responsibility to be a mind reader. It's their responsibility to be okay with it and right. be a good mm -hmm. human being about it. But a physical disability quite often leads to physical access needs. Mm -hmm which I've got to disclose. But so we, it's almost yeah. helpful. We were saying as well, it's, all, it's almost a reflection on how cool you are with your own disability. And, and I went through a phase where I wasn't, so I didn't disclose it. Mm -hmm. uh, Whereas I'm yeah. getting more and more comfortable with it and I'm just thinking, all right, you know, I'm, this is, like you said, this is me, this is the package. Yeah. Do you want it or not? Totally. Because you went on first dates. Yes. <laughs> and I, from what I've seen of that show, they're really good at pairing people up. They so are. what was that experience like for you? 
So I want it for me. I was going through a bit of a time in my life where I was having a crisis of confidence. So I was like, what's the scariest thing I can do? to put oh, myself wow. out there Amazing. and That's test so cool. myself. I love that thought process. <laughs> and see the reaction. And if I can go through this and if I can put it on TV and like have my deepest, darkest fears mm. out for everybody to, to know and to judge, if I can do that, then you know what? I'm actually probably deep down, I'm probably all right with myself. Yeah. So they put me with this really lovely guy. He was, you know, he was so nice, so... He was just, he was cool, easy to talk to. Um, he was a vet and we were both into animals. We had a lot in common, like talking about animals and stuff, but um, it didn't lead to, to romance, but it did lead to me thinking, this is, you know, this is okay. How yeah. I am is okay. Mm. And um, yeah. That's so cool though that, yeah, like your thought process from like this, like I hard just time and then you were just sad. like, I'm gonna go do this thing. Yeah. I was fed up of yeah. being insecure about it. I was like, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna be that girl anymore. I hate, I would hate to have a first date where they didn't know that something... He didn't know. Yeah, he walked me? in and he didn't even, he hadn't, I was scared he was going to walk out. He had no idea. Yeah. So, because I said I just wanted to be sitting down at the table. I didn't want to do a big reveal mm. where the doors open and, yeah. you know, the automatic <laughs> doors and yeah. here she comes rolling in. <laughs> no, I didn't So you were already, that. like, sat there? I was sat yeah. there and, yeah, it was up to him to kind of bring it up, I guess. I think one thing that's really amazing about that that you probably didn't, I don't know if you thought that this was going to happen, is that actually by challenging yourself and putting yourself out there, you've also really changed a lot of perceptions in society and given other people who are disabled that confidence to go, hell yeah, yeah, I'm hot and that's all right. You know, like, yeah. and that's amazing that you've done that. So, cheers, guys. Yeah. Appreciate that. I'm going to go watch that episode now. <laughs> yeah. Go tell me which one it is. One thing I wanted to ask is that, do you think your disability opens up more communication around sex in a way that maybe able-bodied people could learn from? Do you know what I mean? This is a tough one. So I was just saying to the, ta so the taxi driver that brought me here, mm -hmm. his first question was, been in a wheelchair all your life, love? That was the first thing he said to me. And I was thinking, oh God, I bet you got all the ladies, don't you? <laughs> But it actually led on to a really, really good conversation. So his daughter works for the Huffington Post and um, I was saying to him that one of the first questions that I think a lot of us disabled people get asked if we go to a bar and um, someone finds us attractive is, hi, can you have sex? Yeah, like, can you even can have yeah. Yeah. Like, And everyone so in school. Before, yeah, before there's any kind of introduction, before, <laughs> I think you're really great. What are you interested in? Are we going to actually be compatible? It's, let's get this question out of the way. Can you have sex? Hi, what's wrong with you? And can you have sex? Yeah. yeah. And you know what? I think people, they don't have awful intention about it. They're, they're coming at it with the best of intention, but the delivery is appalling. Yeah. And, <laughs> and secondly... <sighs> It takes a long time to then lead that into an, a, a chat of education and awareness because quite often you just think, fuck off. Yeah. Just can't be bothered. Yeah. yeah. So I think that question, I think it's a tough one. What about like in a relationship though? Because if there's other things you have to consider and then you, there's more things to talk about, do you think it helps? I think yeah. the most obvious thing for people who are having sex and one or both of them are disabled is exactly the same thing as for people who are having sex and they're both able-bodied, it's just communication. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it has the potential to, like, because disabled people are so good or can be very good at adapting to new situations and communicating our needs and almost problem solving, although in that in this context it doesn't sound so sexy. But um <laughs> problem solving <laughs> problem solving. <laughs> but I think because of that and because we're so used to the questions and talking about our impairments, it can often lead to better communication in, in relationships. But I think that again, you know, we are in we are all human as well, so we can be extremely fallible in regards to not communicating what we want or what we need in the same, in the same way as well. Speaking of sexy problem solving, <laughs> um, so what are like some practical things that can assist disabled people with sex? Because one of the things that I was thinking about is like with my stoma bag, it like part of it is attached to me and then the rest of it like is flapping around uh, and that can just get in the way and my sexy problem solving has been crotchless high-waisted underwear. Amazing. Raw, that is sexy. And yeah. sexy, yeah. yes. And, or, or, and like also like full body 
sexy Like lacy, things. short, yeah. play suit yeah. So it like yes, keeps Hannah. the stoma bag in place. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's my sexy problem solving. Amazing. But, but yeah. like some kind of cool corsetry thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. not so anything that just like yeah. keeps it down, but then What's well, access? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> That's so wow. good. I think wow. one of my yeah. biggest... So I've written a few articles on this and I think one of my biggest kind of tips to people is look at what you're already using. So even though it doesn't look it, a lot of equipment that disabled people already have in the house and already use can be made really sexy. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a hoist, turn it into a sex swing. Oh, wow, oh yes, God. yes, yes. If you've got a handle by <laughs> your bed that you, need, that you need to help transferring you in and out of a bed, stick some handcuffs on it, man. Like, you know what I mean? You can, you can make these <laughs> things like, sexy. You've just got to turn your mind to it. Yeah. And I think that's, like, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That is really cool. We get a lot of um, questions into the Love Lounge at Enhance the UK, don't we? And you, you in particular, you were answering those for a long yeah. time. And yeah. you were saying that um, pe people often, work, like, they talk about wedges. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. What, what, what do the wedges do? So, sex furniture, if you like. So, there's... Um, quite a few companies that do this and they're really expensive so you know what cut some foam up and put a pillowcase on it and do it yourself but if for example you get a lot of back pain um or pelvic pain or something like that you can you can almost create a wedge so instead of using pillows have a bit of a foam wedge so that your body is positioned to make it a lot more comfortable for kind of deeper penetration and things like that and yeah, it's amazing it's amazing what you could do if you just put your mind to it a little bit yeah pillows everything yeah yeah, yeah absolutely We've actually been working with a company to try and design some uh, disable-friendly sex toys. <gasps> yeah, so um, for example, if you uh, find it difficult to grip, there yeah. would be some sort of like a, 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 a helpful grip on there. Um, it's just in its infancy at the moment, but I mean, th there is a demand for it. There is mm. a demand for... Because I've seen some that have, um, like it's not something that you like necessarily hold, but it's got like a hook in it, so you can it, grip it that way. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's like lots of different things. Cool. Hot Octopus is also a really good company. Hot Octopus. Hot Octopus. Them, yeah. So they have... They have that sounds like hentai. It, do they call it a guy-brator? Like I, vibrator I know, I know for guys? The, thing, and you yeah. can use it whether you're hard or not. Like amazing if you've got a medical issue and you now struggle. It's like a... Yeah, it's like a... Thing that yeah. Goes around it. Yeah, like, like a, vibrating plates. <laughs> Look at us like this. Don't nobody wants to come on this face. Let's try and explain it. Okay. <laughs> and we also have um, something called the Queen Bee that's like a, a clitoral stimulator, I think they call it. And basically, if you've got limited dexterity, so you can't move your hand all the way down, it's got a really long handle. So you mm. can kind of hold the top of the handle and it'll do the job for you. Just minimal is, effort yeah, from you. Yeah, this great. is all great in sign language. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. No, this is kind of being acted out over there. <laughs> Excellent. I wanted to like jump back to Emily, what you said earlier about the question of can you even have sex? Yeah. And the like impact this question has, but then also what it says about society's desexualization yes. of disabled people. Yes. Because mm. they're saying that. And I feel like I feel like there's a hidden question behind it. It's like, can you even have sex? But also, they're thinking they want okay? to know, but then they Is also okay? like don't want to as well. Maybe there's a, the, I think personally, there's a big problem with jumping guys. But I think that like disabled people are quite infantilized so when people are asking oh, that yeah. question can you even have sex what they're also really asking is is it okay for me to fancy you okay, because yeah, you're yeah. seen as somebody who's n not sexual a bit mm. childlike mm. that needs yeah. care yeah. and actually I, feel, I do fancy you flipping hell you're really hot you're really hot but <laughs> but I don't feel that it's right mm. to yeah. and I, I think that's almost like mm. a second question in itself but of course, nobody. Nobody, even the people that ask, can you even have sex, would kind of ask that. I found definitely from my 70 first dates that in they, they had quite an even split in that when I explained my condition to them, people go one of two ways. They either go the, oh my God, no, I cannot cope with this. Yeah. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave at the end of this date. Okay, bye, bye. Mm -hmm. Or they'd go, oh. And suddenly, oh, let me and you can like, you see it in their eyes and they go from like, hey, you're cute. And suddenly it's like, oh. Yeah. 
<laughs> and you're like, oh, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and maybe it has a lot to do with being a lesbian as well, because right. I've only ever dated women, so maybe it's mm. a woman thing. I don't know. But it kind of goes from, like... The, there is actually a thing called the care fetish. Yes, the care oh. fetish. That I think you're totally touching is on that there. Same, different to devotee. So it's a similar. Well, it's it's a fetishism in a way of disability. Okay. Some. Should, are we talking about devoteeism now? Shall we? we? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's jump in. Define right. it. Emma. M, did a doc M did a documentary on it. Oh, you did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she is the expert. Okay, expert. It's yeah. a little. It's a little bit. Um, dark and bizarre and it was quite the the way that it all came out was quite sensationalized which is not remotely what i meant or why i went into the journey of doing it um it was for education and awareness purposes and it didn't quite turn out like that um but devotees um in a very very broad sense find disabled people and disability sexually arousing mm -hmm. um they find the and, struggle attractive, don't they? Yeah, so there's there's two things. And, and not every devotee feels like this, absolutely not. But um, there's a care fetish where people get off on that idea of looking after somebody. Mm. And there's also something called the struggle fetish where some devotees get off on. For example, if I was putting my uh, supermarket carrier bags in the boot of my car and then transferring into my car someone would be watching me and getting off on the fact that I was struggling to do all of that and get into my car. Right. Um, so there's those yeah, two yeah. things. Yeah. And, and you know what, it's really important to say that some disabled people find devoteeism really, really it's uh, for them, liberating. It? Yeah, it's for them. They really celebrate it. They think, yeah, well, why the hell not? I'm disabled, I'm going to be disabled for a long time for the foreseeable future. Why not have somebody that celebrates it and can really explore that with me? However, for a lot of disabled people, it's something that they find very oppressive, that they really mm. feel like they want to get away from. Um, because why would somebody close in on that one aspect of you? Yeah. If it is a fetish, the, the way that I understand fetishes is that that person can't like help those feelings. Like That's just like what they happen to be aroused by. Uh -huh. So where's that line between respecting their desires but also protecting. Do you have to respect their desires, well, though? Well, I just think you wouldn't get on board. You wouldn't yeah, maybe, necessarily or not have indulge Why do yeah, we have yeah. to respect all people's desires? Not everyone has a desire that is a great thing for the rest of the world. Yeah, I don't know that we have to respect them all. Yeah. Mm. It's like, people have kinks, sure, that's fine. But if your kink is something possibly illegal... Yes, of course. Maybe... Yeah, I think... I think so, so there's also kind of a bit of divide within devoteeism. Some people consider their devoteeism a fetish and some people consider it a preference. Mm. There was somebody that I met that I interviewed that said he's felt, you know, he's, he's um, past middle age now. He, uh, there wasn't the internet around when he knew that he was a devotee. He spent 20, 30 years of his life feeling very, very lonely, very cast out. Um, now he has the internet, he sees that there's other devotees there, he feels liberated by being a devotee, and he likened his devoteeism as as to being gay in the 50s. Right, okay, that's interesting. So he said, yeah. my, my devoteeism is a preference. I do not find women who are non-disabled sexually attractive at all. Oh, really? I only find disabled women attractive, and actually I felt so isolated in my life I have to I have to relate it to how gay people felt in the 50s to how trans people felt 10 years ago and maybe even now. So he he really kind of related it as a preference not as a yeah. fetish. Is there a risk there of disabled people being taken advantage of? Like what yes. like oh, that's oh, the yeah, thing. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Cuz you like get into that. a situation where this person is your access mm. to the world. It's not just that I think often if you're a disabled person and you have an able-bodied partner, they are your access to the world because they, whether you've got a physical disability and they're the one that in the morning helps you into your chair maybe, and then you go out in your chair and you're out in the world. If they weren't there, maybe you wouldn't be able to do that. Or maybe you've yeah. got, like I have, a la I have obviously a language issue. I can't understand what people are saying. So I need there to be a person who can help me communicate with the rest of the world. And, like, I get really upset. I'm getting really upset now. Um, no, I understand. Because I've had like people 
um, in my past who were maybe my like friends and they, they had, I try not to be really specific, but there was a person in my life who could sign um, and they were hearing and they were my friend and we could go out together to places and they would um, sign for me so I know what's going on, which is like, amazing, you're yeah. my access yeah, yeah, yeah. to the world. And it's like cool and cash, because it's not like, no offense, Ruthann, but it's not like I have an interpreter here with me. It's like, this is just my friend. Mm -hmm. They're really cool. But then they started to quite like me. Oh, okay. Romantically. And then what do you do? At the time, I didn't have a lot of people in my life, and I didn't have a lot of people in my life who could help me to to sign and, and to, to step understand what's going on, yeah. And you feel kind of trapped and like, mm. uh, do, what do I do? I, I personally think that it's not dissimilar to us saying there needs to be inclusive sex education, otherwise disabled young people are much more likely open and to likely abused. to be abused. Mm. The, people need to be educated and made aware of devotism because not being educated and made aware of it means that you can't make a choice as to whether you want to get involved with it yeah. or not. You it's, want that it's access. It's the same with gay sex don't. education. That's you right. need to tell gay pe gay teenagers how to have sex yeah. safely, otherwise they're just going to have sex guys, anyway. People yeah. need to get their safe. heads around the fact that we can have sex, we do want to have it, and that we're not kids first of all. Like totally. that's mm. that that doesn't even comprehend at the moment. Yeah. I think the kind of question of can we even have sex is... Uh, oh, are you all right, Jess? Yeah, sorry. No, don't say sorry. I'm always like a ball of emotion. No, darling, so we're much. talking about really yeah, personal things. Yeah. <laughs> I told you before I came here, I was bawling my eyes out, so I wouldn't worry about <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> this this could all end with, like... <laughs> 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 um, sorry, come on. It's all right, Not it's fine. I was, what I was going to say was, I think the, going back to the question of can we even have sex, it kind of shows how limited our view of sex as a society is like we always see sex as penetration and actually sex can be passion sex can be you know, a hug. yeah a kiss. well maybe not well, no, like intimacy <laughs> oh, I right, guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah not sex yeah, yeah. Sex. <laughs> i was gonna say because then we've all <laughs> <laughs> been cheating it's on everyone <laughs> but i think that if we can broaden out that definition yeah. of what do we mean by sex then actually we can kind of welcome that that question a little bit more and i think the answer to that question as well because i've been asked it in numerous occasions in numerous forums and someone even tried to put their hand down my trousers once and asked if i could get an erection oh um so um charlie well, that trump card story <laughs> that's not okay mate you've no, just thrown that in there that's really not all right it's uh, it's uh, oh, from, so, um, but you know, it's kind of the answer to that question of can I have sex is ultimately down to the person that I choose to have sex with. Yeah. And I think that I'm fine with the curiosity, but as you were saying earlier, it's very much about the delivery yes. because the way that it's said often shuts down any discussion. Mm. And it's also because the desexualization of disabled people is so rampant it kind of people are always surprised by it and i don't think we should be but i think that we should also be respectful of the people that don't want to have sex at all and don't want to kind of engage well you know for whatever reason and i think that that's really important as well as a society we put so much pressure on this idea or this ideal of sex that we don't necessarily recognize that there's a whole spectrum of kind of normal and that kind of thing and that word normal well <laughs> yes, it's exactly. a favorite of all of us <laughs> actually which axis of normal are we talking about here oh wow um i wanted to talk about mental health as well so like has your disability I mean, you kind of touched on it briefly as well like has that ever affected your mental health and has that then affected your relationships yeah 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 i think like i went through a phase where i felt quite frustrated with myself and didn't articulate myself very well to people as to how i was feeling i just didn't talk about it um 
and it also it, it kind of it it almost made me grateful that the my ex boyfriends were with me. And I was like, oh, thank, you know, I'm so glad that I found somebody. I'm so glad that they're putting up with me, that they're sticking with me, that they're staying by me. It made mm. me grateful, which then meant that I was not losing power in the relationship, but I wasn't, if you're not secure and confident, like you're, you're losing half the battle already. Mm. And I would, you know, I would just turned into a bit of a doormat. And you accept, you accept things that you wouldn't usually right. think are okay. Right, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think it affected me definitely emotionally in that way. Yeah, for sure. I definitely felt that in my life. And I've only had two relationships, but in my previous one, I very much felt like I was always on the back foot. It was always it's thank worst. you. It's and always of, like, like the, the thank leaving. you. And I'm like naturally a really optimistic, quite confident person. I'm quite chipper. I'm like, yeah, I go through life like whatever. <laughs> and oh my God, this girl really kind of messed me around emotionally and you know, the stuff she did was not great, and I would not let that happen to my friend. But I was like, but you let it happen to yourself. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. no one else is gonna like me, because like, I was 23 when I met her. No one had, no one like people had liked me. They're like, oh, you're so pretty, but they're not gonna take it somewhere. And no one previously had, so I thought, this is it. What am I gonna do? Mm. And then when we finally, mm. when she finally dumped me for like the fourth time in a row. <laughs> And of course, then I always went back when she said, I've had a similar oh, no. experience. Yeah. I was like, OK, I'll come back. OK, I'll go again. OK, I'll come back. And OK, I'll go. So like, too why? Too yeah. Too and then tight. when it finally happened, I spent three months just crying, straight crying. I was like, this is it. It's gone forever. No one will ever love me. I was always, and it was always a thing, like, it was always great that she, yeah. that she put up with that. Right. Mm. And then I met Claudia, who's like, and yes. so you you're deaf and like no nah. and it's just per sorry darling you have a much nicer voice than that i'm sure don't ignore me um so she was always like my disability is just part of me to her and i know that and it doesn't affect anything so like i always say this but like, she'll help me up the stairs at night time but she'll grab my bum at the same time and yeah, i'm like so yes, cute. this is what i want in my life but you end up putting up with stuff that you just really wouldn't put up with yeah like, but just because you think it's almost a trade-off yeah. like i honestly felt like it was sort of a negotiation i'll help you with your shit if you help me with mine yeah mm. and that's not a relationship that's not a team yeah when you're supposed to be equals. There yeah. shouldn't, but I don't think it should even be about like, oh, we have to stay equal. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be any kind of scorecard at all. Yeah. It's like, oh, in this moment, you need this. Cool, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And then even if like the next five times it's the same person who has the need, it should just be met, no questions oh, asked. There should never be. And, and for me. Yeah, like if you're keeping count, then that's just a red flag. Totally. Yeah. yeah, even with sex, like yeah. just. Totally. And I, I don't think it's, until you've got that good person in your life yeah. that you realise mm. that. I, yeah. I, I'm a really strong believer in that. When you're with the person yeah. that's, that's right, you totally get that. You need that person to help you unlearn all the stuff you've yeah. been told before by society. I don't know where they are. We'll Honestly, find them for there. you. We'll <laughs> yeah. find him. Um, this I, is the thing, your choices aren't limited. You're right, <laughs> we have choices. Yeah. There are plenty of fish. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are some other websites too. <laughs> yeah, other yeah. Websites other websites. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think one thing that's really important is that these like magical, amazing, nice people, they don't even know how nice they are. So they're not aware that they that might date someone it. with a disability. Sure. That just really doesn't true. even come into their consciousness. Yeah, for me, going back to kind of the mental health thing, it's never been kind of relationshipy with me it's always been when i when i before before i ever had sex i was really worried about it after mm. i split with my ex-boyfriend i had like a sex phobia like it was the physicality of it that bothered me not the relationship stuff physicality right. in terms of how how would you manipulate and move your body like how would it fit yeah. like would you get be in pain how would they yeah, and Feel. I think also that you think, well, he really liked it when I did that, but he's the only person that I've had sex with. So how's that other person going to feel? And are they, are they going to like A, B and C? Mm. Are they going to be comfortable with this about my body? Because just because he was, it doesn't mean that he will be. That really bothered me. Darling, I think 
everybody, All, feels, everybody like feels like that. Yeah. The first time yeah, you get yeah. naked in front of like yeah. a prospective partner is the scariest thing ever. Yeah, I'm sure. But I think that for disabled people, there's an added element of... Yeah. Because if I, if I wanted to have had more casual sex than I've had... You could have done. I could have done. But you've put it off. <laughs> Me too! And I'm so regretful that I'm in a really good relationship! <laughs> Tried before. I know, I know, I'm really happy and I'm like, oh. No, it's not that, it's because there's an extra, uh, it's because there's an extra added level of trust yeah. that is needed yeah. between You're me right. and a, posit- uh, a possible sexual partner that means that actually it, it, you know, it might not work out and we, you, in order it's not to, just yet. yeah, you can't have that, you can't have that conversation. It's not casually. as straightforward as boom, boom, yeah. boom. It's not. It's not. Is, it, is it ever that easy? <laughs> I think from a disabled person perspective, yeah. yes, right, yeah. I think if I get yeah, what you're saying, point. it's like able-bodied people, when you get naked in front of someone for the first time, you are putting your emotional trust in them, saying you're going to take mm. my emotions and you're going to protect them. You're not going to look at my, dis- at my body and go, Ew. Yeah. <laughs> like you're going to be kind and careful with them but then also if you have a disability you're like so you're going to giving you my emotional trust mm. but i'm also giving you my physical trust so if you could be like a little bit careful right mm, now right. that would be great just respond really quickly if i say ow okay <laughs> yeah yeah and just going quickly back to the mental health stuff i think that most of my own mental health issues have been derived from the way that I am treated by society, not necessarily because of my own kind of things. And I think that because of the dehumanization that we have as disabled people, because our worth, because often society's, society put, places worth on you based on things like, can you have sex based on things like, can you work? Though, can you earn money? Those kind of things. Those are the things that have, very much impacted on my kind of own depression and, and various other things That's because such a good point. because I think that I and we generally as disabled people can compare ourselves all the time to yes. others more so maybe than non-disabled people but I think also there's a real issue that we don't talk about it like the fact that we are all here today talking about this is a massive rarity mm. whereas actually if we built our own peer groups, our own communities around disability or around whatever we wanted to talk about, then we could learn from one another and talk with one another and and kind of really listen to one another and kind of share those experiences so that we don't feel so isolated. alone and isolated. I already feel better today, having like Aww. talked to everybody. Like seriously, yeah. I, Absolutely. it's such a good point. Like deep down in our core, I don't think any of us are unhappy with the way that we are. I think like we're, ne- we're just unhappy with the way that we're treated sometimes. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. such a good point, Charlie. Charlie, you kind of touched on it before. Charlie's well <laughs> happy about his point. <laughs> I really need a I'm wee. So yeah, can I go for a wee? I think we're almost done. Right. Okay. But I just wanted to ask, like... Need a wee, everyone. <laughs> Good <laughs> to know. I've just been pooing constantly yeah. throughout, throughout this whole thing. I'm surprised, like, I've not heard her fart. Um, but I wanted to ask, because you briefly mentioned about, like, the LGBT community um, and that, intersection but Nima what about with race because you were talking yeah. earlier about comments from your parents uh, well yeah, yeah comments to my parents like I will say right now that my parents are not included in this bracket oh, okay. whatsoever oh, okay. my god no way they are <laughs> the most loving supporting encouraging family I could ever have wished for and I feel blessed every single day to have been born into that family like seriously they are my they're my lifeline Um, So this is not on them whatsoever. And, you know, when people do come up to my mum in the temple and say, what are you going to do with her? Like, Mm -hmm. like, how is she going to earn any money? Who's she going to live with? Who's going to marry her? Who's going to look after her? My mum's like, straight up. (laughs) Like, see you later. She's been doing doing fine with the money. She's been working in banking for the last 10 years. Thank you very much. She's She's doing all right. She's good. It's fine. Yeah, you concentrate on you and your own, like, waste kids. Like, don't... don't (laughs) Your son would be lucky if my daughter even... Right. No, seriously, that's yeah, that's Worst my mum's. Yeah. I don't know. I just came up with that. <laughs> um, but in the in the uh, Asian community, disability is still very much seen as a really negative thing. 
like a very like oh my goodness like you're being punished from like previous things you've done in your previous lives mm -hmm. and all of that silly old school kind of mentality mm -hmm. um you're not seen as capable whatsoever yeah. and it's it's not necessarily it's not a very empowering community at times because you are you do they do make you feel a bit like a victim mm -hmm. um but you know it's going to take like what we've all said it's going to take education it's going to take people like us talking about these things and showing that bloody hell we are capable and then some mm. yeah. and then people yeah. will learn 100%. and i've had people before kind of approach me in the street and say you know, I'm going to pray for you. Or I'm yeah, gonna I'm going to pray for you. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Faith yeah. Healer. Doing a documentary on that as well. Oh, did you really? We can just plug Emily all day long. Em, what, did they try and heal you? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, did, that and what, work? and, and did it work? <laughs> well, as you can see, not, not quite. Not quite. But I think that the way that we... Um, the way that we kind of talk about disability and the way that others talk to us about our disabilities is... It's quite interesting. I think that I always assume that the LGBT community will be more supportive of a bi guy that's disabled, but that yeah. isn't my experience at all. It's it's almost, it's not necessarily worse, but I think that if you're bisexual, then often people assume that if you're a man, then, then you're going to end up with a, another man, or you know, if you're a woman, then you'll end up with a man as well. And it's just... That, I mean, this is off topic, but that's extremely phallic centric. Um, but I think that you kind of go into the LGBT community as a disabled person thinking, great, these people are slightly marginalised, they'll understand what it's like and those kind of things. And it's not like that at all. And I think that one thing that I often say when I'm like working with others is that disabled people and everyone else can just be assholes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. There's and assholes yeah. everywhere. Yeah, totally. And I think that yeah. we need to almost recognise that and not put people on such high pedestals right. when we're working with them. But yeah. And you know what, yeah, like you said, this is it sounded negative some of the stuff we've said today, but actually what's really positive is that we are sitting here with various impairments and we've got the balls to talk about it. Yeah. And yeah. that we are all here and confident with who we are in ourselves and we're just trying to make we're just trying to influence other people rather than ourselves i think totally. yeah. and you know what like i personally think that slowly but surely it is getting better it is getting better um, yeah. so nima and i and jess also does some some work for them from time to time but we work for a charity called enhance the uk mm -hmm. i started working for them four years ago and you know what until i started working for enhance uh, a disability awareness charity that does amazing things on sex and disability I was not very sexually confident and seeing the colleagues that we have with their impaired bodies going out and doing amazing things, flipping out, I felt really confident, really liberated, really empowered by everything that they do. And there are places out there if you do have any yeah. questions, if you yeah. want to ask anything. Um, and yeah, I think, I think slowly but surely things are improving. Mm. YouTubers who are very influential people are doing things like this. It's flipping important yeah. and mm. fair play to you for doing it. And you know? clearly um, you can see the impact that that had on you because the way you've been talking about sex today, yeah. damn, you're just like, mm. no bars hold. <laughs> I love it. Um, I think this is a really sweet like way to end it um thank you so much thank for you so much for joining us. me thank, thank, you. thank you emily thank you jess thank you nima thank you charlie thank you hannah thank you, thank you so and much yeah this has been great and let's just keep talking about this yeah, yeah we'll just sit here you can <laughs> come back in eight hours <laughs> and you can go for a week <laughs>